Okay, everyone, we might as well kick off now. Uh, Nigel, you're here, uh, and I see that a few other people have joined. Good evening, everyone, uh, to our listeners, to our gracious speaker, Mr. Nigel Titus, Manager, District Planning and Mechanisms in the Urban Planning and Design Department within the Spatial Planning and Environment Portfolio Committee. Good evening, Nigel. Good evening. Uh, I'd also like to wish everyone a warm Hi, everybody. and happy Ascension Day to those of you who celebrate. I know many people around the country would have been attending church services this evening, something which is unfortunately no longer possible due to the ongoing lockdown regulations and social distancing requirements in place. Uh, before we get into it, I'd just like to get some housekeeping out the way. Uh, this discussion is being recorded. So for those of you who do not wish to provide your your consent to being associated with us, please log off now. Uh, the city's district plans are available on the city's website and we'll be sending links to the relevant resources after we post this discussion on our YouTube page. Um, as far as I understand the, the logistics, I think we've muted everyone for now to avoid unintended interference during the discussion. However, for those of you who have questions, if there's enough time at the end of the discussion, we will try our best to accommodate you. Uh, please post questions uh, using the chat feature in the Zoom platform. Uh, now, moving on to our topic for this evening. We're here tonight to discuss the City of Cape Town's district plans. The city has uh, eight districts, as far as I, I understand it, uh, of which the main focus of our discussion tonight is the Kailicha Mitchells Plain Blue Downs Corridor. Uh, district plan. Uh, Nigel, for your benefit, we posted a short introduction to these district plans in January, uh, running a poll with our members to see which of the eight plans they were most interested in finding out about, and the Kailicha Mitchell's plan, Blue Downs Corridor plan won out in the poll, so we're very happy to have you assist our members in unpacking the detail around this particular plan. So just a brief introduction to the young urbanists. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary community aimed at individuals under 35 who have an interest in their city and who want to be more engaged stakeholders in its future. Through social and educational events, we connect people who have a passion for cities. We have over 1,400 members on our Facebook page where you can also check out our manifesto. So without further ado, Nigel, thank you once again for graciously making yourself available for this discussion. I understand you've been working as a planner for many years and that you have a master's in town and regional planning from the University of uh, Free State. Can you please give us a bit of background to your journey to getting to where you are now in the city overseeing such an important piece of work there? Great. Uh, yes, thanks, Sean. Um, as you said, I've got a master's in planning. I did my um, diploma at the, at the, the Oswald Cape Technicon. Um, since my diploma, I joined a planning practice in Cape Town, the CNDV Africa. It went through different changes of names, or name changes. Um, my involvement there has generally been all over spatial planning, land use planning, uh, the, whole, the whole suite of planning frameworks. Uh, working in various areas, Cape Town and um, elsewhere in the country on different kinds of projects. So after about, I think it was 18 years at CNDV Africa, I decided to take a change and then I joined the city. Um, that was about 2012 or 2013. And then um, I started off as, in fact, the district planner for the principal planner for the Kailicha Mitchell's Plain District. And then a, a year or two ago, I became the manager for the, for the unit of district spatial planning and mechanisms, what we do. So yeah, so that's, that's me, generally just, two jobs for awesome. 25 years <laughs> and, 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 uh, and the district plans um, how did you uh, how long has your involvement been uh, in, in that piece of work so the the, 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 the unit's responsibility is essentially one of the that's the major responsibility is to prepare the district plans um, so in 2012 the previous set of district plans were approved and this was the subsequent uh, update of the district plans that we've involved in, that we are involved in. So the process started uh, last year, uh, been a slow process in terms of getting the necessary authorizations to initiate. And um, I've been, we've been involved with it ever since. Um, and we, and I can take you through a bit of a program of, as to where we're going later on when we get to the sort of the presentations that we've, in, that we've prepared. So yes, I've been involved with it and the way we're doing it, we've got um, a district 
principal planner for each district, sorry, for, for two districts, and then they've got some support uh, colleagues in the district. So we're doing it all in-house at the moment with the help of all of our in-house colleagues. I see. Um, and you say it's been a, a, a sort of a, a, quite a slow process. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the nature of a district plan? Uh, you know, we've, we've had actually a very interesting um, session with a young urbanist before uh, involved with the the MS uh, the, the 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 municipal spatial development framework, um, we had a sort of a workshop with our members a few years back uh, where we participated, where we put together a, um, some comments on the MSDF. Could you tell us more, a little bit more about about what the how the district plans you know um, relate to the MSDF? What a district plan is, what it does. I, I went onto the you know the city's website and I and I see that. It aims to achieve a, a number of different things, for example, determining the strategic priorities specific to a geographic area, giving certainty to developers, etc., informing decisions about land use. So basically helping people understand where the city is trying to drive development uh, so that there can be greater certainty to the, those actors and those role players. Um, and I also see that climate change is is also being dealt with as part of these these district plans. Can you give a bit of a background to to what um, the district plans seek to achieve? So, Sean, you've you've got it uh, generally uh, accurate there. The, the district plan does a couple of things. It tries to give you direction. Well, in fact, it sets up the future vision for the area. So, in one way, the plan becomes like your vision statement or your vision plan. And along with that vision, it, it dictates where we would like to see growth take place and what kind of growth we would like to take place. So the plan that you've, are you, you're projecting at the moment, are you? I am, yeah. I think I'm sharing this. Uh... So, right, so that plan is the vision plan. And it sets, that's essentially called, if you, were to, if you were to lose the entire document, that's the most precious piece of the document. Because that, that is your plan or your vision. Now, in there, you see the different colors which sets about what are the proposed uses, general uses we'd like to see in the different areas. So that's your vision. Along with this plan, you have your directions or your guidelines, which then dictates what kind of, how the development in those areas should be treated. Uh, what should happen in the yellow, the green, uh, the, the purple, etc. Yellow being residential, green conservation, generally purple industrial. So it sets those guidelines, um, and then this plan or the document is then used to guide investments in space and decisions around investments. So whether it's private decisions or public decisions. So for instance, a developer comes and the developer says, where can I do more industrial development? And you open up the plan and says, this is where we would like to see it happen based on our experience. So here's the purple, here's industrial areas or residential. Uh, and then when, a dis when an application is assessed by the decision makers, similarly, they use the plan to say, um, what is the policy that the city would like to see in this area? So yes, we'd like to see industrial. Uh, and so your application is either aligned with policy or not aligned with policy. So that is, that is generally what it gets used for. But then we want to take it a uh, level further in the sense that we want to direct the investment of the municipality and all uh, players in space as to where we would like to see investment take place and that kind of investment. So for instance, we want to take it so that we can start an agenda for investment by the different line departments, uh, link that with provincial departments and get them also to play along this vision in the space and hopefully get some timing program and budget program rolled out as sort of a capital investment framework uh, subsequent does to this. this. So it's quite so an important yeah. Uh, no, I was just going to ask if it, if this, if you're speaking sort of to the the built environment performance plan in, in a way you know that relates to the the city's own infrastructure investment rollout program and and where it spends its money. That that's correct. So this plan is meant to inform that built environment performance plan in the future. Uh, the the performance plan is essentially looking at where we're spending our grant funding. So that's a narrow window that the performance plan is doing. It tries to bring in the provincial government spending and national government spending as well, but it doesn't touch your private spending. So this this plan, which is a, a, a level more detailed than your metropolitan spatial plan, 
tries to pick up all of those elements and try to set that agenda in place. So generally it was used as a sort of just a policy guideline or a policy plan and the intention is now to, to take it further and to help uh, so that it can become an investment plan as well, particularly for government and then also to direct uh, private sectors into where we would like to see things happen. And um, the status of the process, you're mentioning just now that, uh, you know, it's been, it's been quite a slow process. There's obviously a lot of public participation that has to go into this um, because, you know, what the, the, the city and what the planners have as an idea, as their, as their vision for, for a district might be quite different to, to you know, what, what people on the ground, uh, you know, what they want for the, for the area. Um, is the, are these new plans that are currently on the city's website, are they, have they now been passed or is there still more of a public participation process uh, that the city wants to go through? Yes, um, Sean, we've, we've designed, we, are, we were hoping to have quite an interactive public participation process and our COVID has come, but we're hoping it doesn't say, we don't stay locked down too long so that we can still have some good public engagements. But the plans that we've got at the moment, in fact, where we are, we are, we're almost midway through the process. So at this stage, we don't have a formal, a similar plan to what you're seeing on the screen. We've got the background research work that we've been putting to pulling together. So, and that has gone through because the plan is going to be a, pub, a, a municipal policy. It has to go through public engagement processes. Mm. So we've designed or the, the aim for our process was to have it as interactive as it as we can. So what we've done, we've sort of announced the process at the start. Then we asked for people to register and, and APs to register. Then we've, we've worked a draft um, baseline report, the baseline information, your background information. And that is what you would have seen in the, or heard about in the public domain towards the end of last year. So that was just, we have the facts right, we understand the challenges correctly, what are the people's more sentiment, where are the sentiments heavily, or those kind of things. So what what our team has been working on and are working on right now is to pull together what we call the main concept and we were hoping to go into a public realm towards next month with that but it may be delayed because of the lockdown processes or regulations and then once that concept is through then towards the end of the year about we'd be working what we call a draft spatial development framework and that would again go out for public engagement and then only it gets approved. So the intention is that because this, the district spatial development framework uh, is a subset of the metropolitan spatial development framework mm. and because the metropolitan one was approved in 2018, this is the parallel one with that but given our local context and local understanding, we may re, it may result in the metropolitan spa, spatial development framework having to be tweaked or reviewed in some places. So the intention is, is to bring them all together at the end of this, this public administration cycle, 2022, when the new local government leadership is being elected and in office, is to then present all of these as one suite of documents. So then mm -hmm. the intention is by 2022, you'll have um, a, maybe a slightly revised spatial development framework for the metropolitan level. And you'll have these eight district spatial development frameworks. Uh, and then you also have your integrated development plan so that you've got a whole suite of forward planning documents with budget lines uh, together as, as one plan. So there's still a bit of a long process. Um, but the, the short view of it is that towards the end of this year, we're hoping to have a draft plan out that can be publicly participated. And then we want to do that as creatively as we can. I won't go into much of those details so that people can have an involvement in there. Okay, excellent. So, so how do we find out about this process going forward? Um, will that be in the in the in the newspapers, in the media? Hundred percent. You shouldn't have to ask me that question a couple of months <laughs> time. But okay, okay, no, that no, sounds we, great. We do uh, <laughs> well, we, yeah, we're no. going. We're going for the for the for the for the draft um, for the baseline report. We went through. We had Facebook. We had WhatsApp messages. We had the newspaper, we had the radio. We intend to do all of that, but I also want to work into the networks for the proposal. So we're going to, 
be calling on you, be calling on the various associations and institutes and, and NGOs and really flood both uh, the printed and the digital media as well as radio. We just can't, I don't think we're going to get the TV, but other than that, we're going to try and get them all again. Awesome. Yes, please, please keep us involved in the process. Um, you know, I know that, that there's a lot of our members who live in this district who, who would really be um, be very interested and very keen to to sort of uh, comment and, and give their input. Sean, if I can add to it. So we're doing all eight at the same time and they all will read the, the newspapers, the, 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 the media all at the same time. So the entire city will essentially be under district planning um, influence, if I can call it that, uh, towards the end of the year. Um, okay. And then we do on our website, if people would like to register, they could essentially just send me their details. And it's simple, it's district.stf at capetown.gov.za. And then we'll put you on the database and then we'll send you direct notification as to where things are at when we sort of the next move of things. Thanks, Nigel. That's perfect. We'll put those maybe after this, we'll put those details up when we, um, when we post our video. So in the meantime, until that, uh, until this sort of uh, particular plan or these plans that you're, that you're putting together at the moment, until those are, are officially promulgated, would a land use planner still be working off the old 20, 2012 plans? That's correct. They would, the, this, the statutory, current statutory plan is a 2012 one. <clears throat> Sorry. So they'd be working off that one. And obviously the updated Metropolitan Spatial Framework um, where that has got information that's relevant as well. Um, so yes, the current statutory plan still stays in place. Perfect. Um, I'm, look, I'm going to move now to, to, to looking at specifically at, at this particular district, Kailicha, Mitchell's Plain, Blue Downs Corridor. I know that you've prepared uh, your own slideshow. I just wanted to ask a few questions uh, specifically about this district. Uh, and and uh, if you wouldn't mind sort of uh, looking at those first, and then we can maybe move over to your presentation, if, if you're happy with that. Well, the presentation is mere background, so if uh, okay. I'm, I'm in your hands, I don't need to do the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> cool, great. Thanks, so, so uh, basically, I, ju I just wanted to to sort of preface the the, the discussion about the this specific district plan by starting off with a, a, a look, a broad overview of this district. You know what this district is, is all about, and and how you know how it is a distinct district how it, it's you know differentiated from from the other districts in the, in the other areas of the city um i'm from somerset west and somerset west really is the outer lying you know outer flung region of the city it really feels like you you're right up against the uh, the mountains and you're very far away from the city but it you know kylie and mitchell's plan they are also very very far from from you know it's it's almost the outer ring of the city um, but it's got a very, very large yeah. population. Um, uh, I don't know if you, you have any, any idea of what the approximate 2020 population is of, of this particular district. Um, the, 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 uh, the figures I could, I could find were, were very outdated from 2011. I, I don't know if you have an updated uh, figure. Um, Sean, I've got, um, we, our colleagues are actually doing it at the moment. They're doing the, the sort of calculations and projections. But it's roughly, I would say it's roughly about one and a half thousand people for the entire district. Um, 20, 2011, it was just over 1.1 million. And uh, our estimates for 2018 was about 1.3. So I would say it's probably about one, between 1 1.3 and 1 1.5 million for the entire district. 1.5. So, so it's... it's almost a third probably of the of the entire yeah. city population yes yes you're right it's a math that's a massive population um and uh, you know something that we found quite quite unusual when we originally posted this on our on our facebook page in january um i had i had been working off a link and i and i, and I thought that the, this particular district was just the kailicha, kailicha district and then i you know I subsequently found out it is actually encompasses kailicha mitchell's plain and the blue downs corridor um, you know, three really large neighborhoods. Um, why has the city decided to put all three of these into one district? That's a, that's a historic district structure or di district delineation, uh, Sean. It was, it was essentially based on 
the various service departments on the city. So they were looking, at, and, I'm, and I'm, I was told it goes back to even before, obviously before 2012. So it was like with the restructuring of the city becoming a uni city and then looking at how best to work, the various line departments were drawing their, their service boundaries. And at that stage, it was decided to follow these boundaries uh, for, for just ease of operations. Um, was aligning, I think it was at that time aligning most of the boundaries of the service areas of, of, of the line departments of the city. Um, but it's, it's absolutely just, it was just an ease of boundaries and service. Of, do, you, yeah. do, you, do you think that's a, that's a problem um, or, or is it an opportunity, I guess? Um, you know, I, I understand, like I said, it's very far away from, from the inner core of, of, this, of the city, of the city bowl. But of course, if you're looking at the, the la larger uh, metropolitan area uh, and you're looking at the Metro Southeast, um, I suppose it's, it's much closer to the geographic center of the city. Um, you know, can you just give us a bit of a, a background, you know, from, uh, from this, this uh, planning process, this, this process of, of uh, investigation and analysis that you've done, uh, and tell us how the three areas sort of relate to each other and, and uh, what the linkages are between them, um, and, and sort of give us a, a, just a, a broad overview of this district. So great, thanks, Sean. So Sean, the way we're doing approaching the planning is not actually to be fixated about the boundaries. So I think you'll be relieved to hear that. Um, as as district planning, and because we're doing all of them at the same time, we almost don't see the boundaries. We're looking at the city as a whole and as a system as a whole, and the boundaries are just coming afterwards to all of the plans. So, so if if we weren't taking that approach, then I think the boundaries would have been a problem because then each district may want it to be the biggest node and each district would want to push their agenda and the relationships between the districts may have gone completely gone. But the approach that we're taking is we're looking at the city as a whole and just, just looking at the planning from there. So the district in itself uh, is, is, is quite unique, as you said. We've got, um, we've got different components. Um, both in terms of differences in components, both in terms of sort of uh, race, where Kailicha is probably your predominantly black township, Mitchell's Plain is probably pre predominantly colored, uh, Blue Downs generally mixed, Blue Downs or north of the N2 generally mixed uh, in that regard. Your poorest population is Kailicha uh, and Mufuleni, Mufuleni is north of the N2. Uh, including West Bank. So what we've got in our district is, is we go north until the Stellenbosch arterial, we go east until the um, until Van Riebeek Road or the Strand Road and then baden Powell cuts uh, east-southeast and then we include um, onto crossroads uh, sort of the M18 and then we come down to uh, Mitch Philippi and Mitchell's Plain. So it's, it's varied, it's got different income levels, quite different, Kailicha, Chenli, uh, Mufuleni, Tafelsuch being our lowest income areas, high uh, unemployment in those areas. In terms of the, the district in itself and, and linkages, essentially mainly the road linkages across the, the rail linkages is all one direction towards uh, at this stage towards the CBD, there is a future Blue Downs rail link that is meant to connect uh, the Nolongili link that's just, or the Nolongili station, which is just north of the Swat Club Denal, that big piece of open land in between Kailicha and Mitchell's Plain. From there, it links through across the N2, through Mufuleni, Blue Downs, and then that will link to Kales River. So that is a, a, a beautiful link that will come in hopefully in the next. It was meant to be 2022. I'm not sure what, what process current timing is. Um, yeah, and then in, in terms of sort of where people move to, it's generally towards, towards CBD, towards Belleville, um, yeah. and not so much inter-district because there's not much sort of employment opportunities within the district itself. Yeah, uh, I, that, I mean, I'm glad you raised that. That's exactly what I wanted to move on to next. Um, I wanted to ask you about this issue of land use planning and how you, it's, I understand from, this, from how this plan 
you know, how it can affect where the city spends its money, um, but how does it affect your land use planning? And for example, specifically what I wanted to talk about is your retail nodes. Um, you know, my, my understanding, you know, from, from my experience of driving around this particular district is, you know, things are very, very disjointed. And, uh, you know, you'll find, for example, a magistrate's court here and then down the road, very far away, you'll, you'll have a, a, a shopping center and then down the road there, you'll have, uh, you know, something else. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much um, in the form of concentrated urban nodes that you find in maybe the, the, the older parts of the city. Um, how do you use a document like this to guide for example, the creation, I don't know, if, you know, hopefully of, um, of retail opportunities, of office development, et cetera, especially in a kind of a compact, um, walkable way that, that isn't really so, so disjointed as it currently is. You know, how can this document um, try to influence what, uh, what private developers are doing and what is the land use like, or the characteristic land use like in this area at the moment? I know it's mostly residential, but is it a single residential? How easy is it for, for developers to, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, create infill development um, for, you know, to introduce more, more uh, retail opportunities and, and even potentially offices, for example, for um, estate agents and, you know, uh, maybe uh, attorneys, offices that, that, that they wanted to, to set up there. Um, you know, how can we, uh, how can this document uh, achieve that sort of goal? Right, thanks, thanks, Sean. Sean, the biggest challenge for us is to make sure that our document is, is um, responds to the needs and the pressures or the direction out there and is obviously takes a good view of that and give appropriate guidance. So for me, that's why I think the public participation and inputs from communities and the, the industry and, and et cetera, et cetera, is important so that we come up with a document that's, that's relevant. If, if, if we achieve that, we will have a document that, that has the buy-in from those players in space. Um, and then the guidelines or the policy within the document would be easily complied with. So whether we achieve that or we don't achieve that, what the document does is the document sets out, and it's a statutory document, so you're not allowed to develop contrary to the document. The decision makers must take account of the document and only if there are really exceptional circumstances and it's motivated, may decision makers obviously deviate from the document. So the document in itself, if it's, if it's built on the right premise, if it's built on the right principles, it should tell us where we want to see industrial, where it should be going, where the commercial should be going, where it's ready to go, and, and should then guide that. The way we, we then manage it is that we, we try and defend this position of the document so that Hopefully, the developments that take place are all in line with the document. Now, that's not always easily achieved because developers may have their own positions and that they want to see happen and they push that. So that's, that's a one way we want to do is through, through kind of strict regulatory control. The other way that we want to implement, and that's why our, our planning office or our planning unit's name has changed in the last few years. It's, they've introduced the term mechanisms into our, our unit. So... What we want to do is to look at uh, incentives or mechanisms that would make it easier for people to develop in the right positions, given that our document has hopefully got the right positions that it shows. So, for instance, if you're saying we want Stock Road to develop into a high street, then what we want to do with the district plan is to say, now, how do you facilitate that? How do you look at the right kind of zonings? How do you look at the right vision for the street? Uh, do you need to look at tax incentives or development levies dropping or what are the kind of mechanisms that we can try and implement to try and promote this happening along with our vision? So that's a, so on the one hand, it's, as I've said, it's maybe a stick. And then on the other side, we want to try and get some carrots going as well so that yeah. we can make it easy and possible for people to follow those. But I think the biggest challenge for me would be to make sure that we've got, we're coming up with the right kind of things. Yeah. And, and, then try and because then it shouldn't be a problem to try and push it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can understand that. So, so you're saying, you know, for example, um, the, the stick, I suppose, would be if, uh, if a developer comes along and, and the, the property that that developer owns is currently zoned for, for a certain, uh, certain amount of rights 
and they want to increase the rights on that property, then then you know that the planner will be will be um, will have you know his or her hands tied if uh, it is not in accordance with with what the plan says. And I suppose from a from an incentive point of view, uh, the city might want to, for example, um, spend money on on urban upgrading, on on landscaping, on paving, on on that sort of the, the beautification of an area. If they want to try and uh, encourage developers to um, you know, to to um, upgrade those spaces themselves and and act as a catalyst um, for that for that precinct. Um, can you can you tell me a little bit about the highlights of this policy from that point of view? You're, you're talking about Stock Road now. You know, one of the the the, uh, the 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 streets that or the roads that I am also particularly interested in is Spine Road. You know, that that development along Spine Road where where that uh, Groover Park is, and and I, I've noticed a lot of um, conversions, residential conversions where uh, the, the the building is actually uh, fronting onto a onto a back street, but now what they've done is they've opened up the the backs of those buildings and and uh, onto Spine Road, um, and it becomes a very um, lively, um, you know, amazing, vibrant place, uh, especially on the weekends and in the evenings. Um, you know what, you know that would be one of my highlights. What are the highlights that you've noticed in this plan as the vision for the city in in terms of specific parts of this of this uh, district? Well, Sean, you've 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 hit the nail on its on its head there. So Spine Road is actually one of our detailed roads that we're looking at, and it's running a bit of a parallel process where the councillors, I mean, I've also had the sense of it over the years, where the councillors have particularly said we need to look with a special, careful note on it to try and facilitate the right kind of development along that. It is definitely pumping with vibrancy, and mm. the, that's one of the exciting roads, I think. I think the yeah. other one that's coming for me in this particular district is is also your sort of your AZ Berman, which is your extension of your stock road. You would see similarly AZ Berman having been transformed. I mean, I don't know if the people have the rights, but there's like doctor surgeries, there's chemists, there's shops all fronting onto AZ Berman. In response to sort of your town centre and your 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 um, promenade mall and your Westgate mall, not sorry, not Westgate water water side we're all coming along that road and if you go that right up stock road towards the old lands and road i think that's also quite an exciting road from that kind of character developing yes. similarly yeah. that's happening in the blue house east sort of way as well yeah and, and hopefully as you say bringing people into the fold where you know uh, development has happened it might not have happened with the with the with the correct uh, policies and procedures and, de and deviation plans and all that sort of thing followed, but yes. uh, it, it is it is a sign of 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 um, you know what the economic climate is like there and what actually makes sense for people. And it would be nice to 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 formalise that um, you know rather than um, than sort of yes. uh, doing away with it. Yes, I think, and I think it's important for this district because this district is different to sort of, let's say, Tigerberg or the Northern District or, or even Claremont Weinberg because this district uh, investment into the bigger A grade offices or major industrial has not been that great. We, we hardly have that happening here. So, for economic opportunities, we've got to look at, we've got to open the palette and make it a bit wider and, and look at other yeah. avenues of economic opportunities. So and especially lowering the barriers to entry because a lot, the problem with exactly. a lot of these uh, these major uh, sh uh, you know uh, you know uh, sh sh supermarkets or, or uh, shopping centres rather with um, you know they they all have the same it's basically yeah. just carbon copy of each other and and uh, that all the the profits made from those from those supermarkets and those national retailers uh, they don't go back they don't really get ploughed back into the into the neighbourhood. As um, you know, a mom and pop shop or, or, or you know a, a store that's that's completely 100% owned by someone from that neighbourhood. Um, no, but obviously, no. people have no other option. If that's all the retail that's provided, then then people have to use that. Now you 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 hitting it right there because I think we've got a challenge here. We, we we don't only need to provide the facilities. We've got to look at how we share the wealth uh, and make the city less unequal. Um, and and how do you get the money back into the local households so that they can spend and they can use it? So and that's why I think from from even though this is a spatial development framework, the economic layer to this framework is, is for me is vitally important because we, we can't just put some color 
focus on a map and say industrial is going to be there and hope that industrial is going to create enough jobs and enough income for the people in the area. We've got to look at other other opportunities and ways to start stimulating that. Just to give an example, in my colleagues, one of my former colleagues um, did some work in Langa, where they looked at the Langa main road and they started as a, as a project to proactively rezone, uh, I think it's Washington Street or something like that, in Langa. And that proactive rezoning was to give people opportunities to do uh, shops and uh, work from home and to do your bed and breakfasts and stuff to start stimulating the economy and enjoy the character of the area along with that. So those are the kind of things that I'm hoping that we can get to um, through the district plan that we're looking at these various levels of entry and to stimulate the economy. Just to come back to your other point about what are the exciting things of this district, there's a couple of things for me that's really exciting. One is, um, this is a unique district. You've got sort of, you've got, You've got the coast, you've got the the dune areas along with it, you've got a fantastic resource in the, in the sense of the river going through it, the Kales River, which which I think is, could be like a central park of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are quite natural, quite useful and, and beautiful natural assets. Uh, then obviously we've got the Philippi horticultural area on the western side, which 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 definitely starts giving it a unique place and unique opportunities. We've, we've, I don't know if you're aware, but the AXA Airports Company of South Africa bought the, the older now SWAT clip land between Mitchell's Plain and, and, and Kailicha. Yeah. And they're looking at the redevelopment of that land. So in my mind, that's probably another node of a huge kill that could happen over there with employment, retail, all sorts of opportunities. And then we also closely link yeah. to the airport. Sorry. No, no, Karen. Sorry, and they were saying we also obviously closely linked to the airport. So, I mean, those linkages are quite amazing. And then you've got, with you're on the N2, you're on the R300, which means you're with, within about five to eight minutes on the N1 as well. So you've got excellent, as like you said, it's like it is the, it's, it's like the fourth node of the city here yeah. that needs to start coming up, up. Absolutely. And so, you know, you were mentioning now these, um, there's, there's so much scope for recreation and upgrading of, the, of, of existing recreational areas and open spaces. Um, the, the SWAT clip site is, is very interesting. We, we've discussed this before with the young urbanists. Um, do you know why? So, so I suppose that, you know, when, when you were uh, taking uh, or carrying out your, um, your analysis and your research, would an entity like AXA, would you approach them and would, would, would they be intimately involved in, uh, in this process? Yes, so we, we, um, we approach all, all the players um, and definitely they're running their own process in terms of their local uh, concepts that they're developing. And as a city, we are playing a big role in it um, so that we can tie and steer it in the right direction or a good direction, whatever way you want to call that. So definitely they will be big players, airports company for both the AXA, the, the airport, as well as for the proposals on the land. And so also all, all sorts of departments and entities would be involved. I see. And um, from, a, from a, a sort of a, a management of city infrastructure point of view, you know, I, and I suppose city owned land as well, you know, what, what are the opportunities from, from the point of view of, of land that the city already, already owns I, i'm i'm post uh, there's a there's a slide up here at the moment that just shows how much open wide open space there is undeveloped land uh in in around the the, the sort of the kailicha um town center uh, or at least the higher order node that uh, that's yeah. represented on the plan is is who is this land owned by mostly so so the land is underlying owned by the city um, but the city has got a land availability agreement, has entered into a land availability agreement with the community or the community trust for Kailicha. And so the Kailicha Community Trust manages this. And uh, how can I call it? They, they act like the. Um, I was going to use an analogy, but it's not working right. So they, they manage the land and they, they're looking at development partners for the land. I see. Um, to try and develop the land. So the land that you see vacant there at the moment, um, there's, there's proposals at different la layers or levels for, for all of that land at the moment. 
Um, I've got another slide that shows, probably not here, that shows a development framework that has been divide, de designed for this area and some of these things are actually uh, taking off already. I see. For okay. instance, the shopping centers looking at expanding, uh, there's residential being looked at uh, on, the, on the other side of this big, well, I think it's Walter Sassoula that you see in the middle. There's a bit of the sports precinct around the pool that's going to come develop. Yeah, so all of all of this land that's vacant now, there's actually proposals at different layer, levels of maturity that's being looked at at there. But, and, but I think your overall question is, will the city be using, I, th I think your question is, will the city be using its land and how will the city be using its land? Yes, definitely. Yes, how, how quickly, I guess, as well, because, um, you know, the a big, I suppose, you know, at the moment, a lot of this landscape is sort of just featureless, wide open spaces. It's not safe. Um, especially at night for people to cross and and I just hope that you know somehow this plan will will also have uh, um, you know create or lead to some kind of a, like a, a good urban design for this area as well I mean I know that the city has its urban design policy um, but I don't know how um, you know how much it's actually enforced um, from the point of view of um, you know making places um, not sort of insular not having big fences around each other um, you know, making safe spaces for people that are built up to the street, um, you know, without these sorts of disjointed big open pieces of land. 100%. In fact, those policies, okay, so at the district plan, we may be a bit too high level for the implementation of those policies, but definitely those policies are being used to guide the actual projects that, that are coming up. So just to give an example, when an application is submitted, the urban design department, or, or, which is our sister branch, uh, they comment on the applications along with us. And we look at those kind of things that you're raising, applying the policy to make sure we try and implement um, developments that's, that gives us that kind of feel we want to get in our city. Um, but you, I think you must understand it's always a bit of a battle between a meeting of the minds. Yeah. So there's always a negotiation sometimes we and then we're going to cry and then just going to pick up our bootlaces and start over again. So yeah, but yeah, the, the intention is to apply those things um, down to the ground level. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, we, yeah, we, we uh, people with the technical know-how can only, can only do so much, I suppose, at the end of the day, it's always a political process and, and a negotiation um, to try and achieve the, the outcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nigel, I've got I've got two questions here from um, from uh, Rebecca Cameron, actually, uh, who's who's also part of the, the Young Urbanist uh, uh, part of our steering committee. She's she's asking, is anything changing in the city's objectives or goals for this plan due to the lasting impact of COVID nineteen? That's the first question, and the second question is, how is the plan working with the hydrological conditions of the area given the underlying aquifer? Yes, yeah, so. So we've not looked at, um, because we're still developing the plan, so I'm, I think we are going to bring in some, some lessons learned from, no, not I think, we are going to bring in some lessons learned from the COVID-19 experience. I mean, one, one big consideration that we're all now wrapping our heads around is that interestingly, we've all been, or most of us have been working not in our buildings for the last month plus. <laughs> So do we really need all of those buildings? Can't we just change the civic center to a residential development? Oh, sorry, we <laughs> must shut up. But those kind of things, um, we, we are looking at those. In fact, yeah. at the same time as we're doing the plan, we're doing a model for where do you locate the future growth of the city and how much growth can you accommodate? And that 100% is being influenced by, will be influenced by what COVID is teaching us. Yes, um, so and, and maybe, will... it better, maybe it is better for all of us to work at home and not be on the roads and spend all those hours and congestion and pollution and all of those kind of stuff. Correct. There must be thousands of people coming from this district into town every single day and driving back again. It's, it's crazy. Yes, yes, they are. I mean, I, I travel through the N2. I come from Kells River down onto the N2. And if I eat, if I eat the N2 at 6 o'clock, I get to the office by 8 o'clock. So that's that's one hundred percent. Lots of lessons there. Yeah, um, it's hours of people's lives. Yeah, no, I spend two hours at least per day, at least per day on on the road, and I'm enjoying it currently. <laughs> um, on the second question of Rebecca, yes, 
what we do with the plan, the, the baseline report that I spoke about, analyzes the, the areas in layers. So we go through, let's say, natural systems layer, the water bodies, the water systems, the, the, the we, don't, we don't quite go into the soils this time around, but we go into the vegetation, we go into the mountain areas, the river areas, etc. So the hydrological regimes play a big role, the aquifers, we've brought that into the consideration this time around, previous uh, district plan didn't have all of that information, but based on our water challenge over the last few years, a lot of focus has been on that information is available, so 100% that comes in as well. And so things like the PHA, uh, as an example for recharge areas, those areas are all been highlighted. And the policy of the plan needs to respond to those requirements or those needs that we have. Mm. So, yes, we do look at the hydrological regime, just like we look at vegetation and all of those other kind of elements in terms of proposals. From a, from a vegetation point of view, um, are they, you know, how does the city have plans to, to plant more trees, for example, to, to beautify, that sort of thing? So, yeah, it's two different, well, it's two different departments. One is in terms of the current vegetation, natural vegetation that's sensitive. The, how do you protect those? So those are, those are sort of um, policy guidelines that go into there. The planting is another is another unit, which is our sort of our parks and, and, and amenities, social facilities unit. Um, where we do plant would be a, a process of, would be an outcome of various proposals. So, for instance, if the district plan should suggest that sort of our main arterials, maybe that's the wrong one, but let's just suggest that it may be well. All the main arterials needs to be avenues of trees. And that could be a proposal that could could be taken through and hopefully if it's agreed to it becomes it becomes implemented and budgeted i mean it depends on how we want to the, the kind of vision we have for the areas and would, um, yeah, would so so that would be something that you might recommend based on your analysis uh, that you know you might recommend that to the city as part of this vision um is that is that something yes, that, that would be included in it could be because that would be the projects that emerge out of the plan. So, as I said earlier, the plan has got a vision. It's got the guidelines, policy guidelines. Uh, it could then have projects that come out of it that starts to work into an investment framework. So, I mean, if we look at this aerial photograph that you have of Kailicha, very, very few trees. Yeah. So, the, the response could be, let's start a program of greening the city in this area. Yeah. Oh. I think that could be an amazing one and getting some sponsors and donors and stuff like that uh it could be really amazing okay cool i'll uh, include that in uh, in my comment <laughs> please do <laughs> <laughs> sure um okay i i we we we've, we've uh, we're getting close to the to the end here that i just got a, a couple more um a couple more questions um so the one is is, is a bit it's looking at you know this discussion that we had at the time of the of the municipal spatial development framework there was a very strong um i think departure from the previous msdf which as far as i understand was cadastrally linked so so it was the plan was linked to this the survey general's office um you know and and it really you know so so in other words each point on the on the plan uh re, you know would be able to be identified to a specific earth um, is that the case with this plan or, 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 you know, for example, is it easy for a land use planner to know when they're getting an application, oh, this falls exactly within that part of the plan and that's within this color and therefore um, it's easier for me to make my decision? The, the nature of this plan would, would generally say, we would generally say yes, but the idea is, well, it's, I won't say it's quite linked to the survey general, but it's cadastral, you, you could, you should be able to get that clarity from this level of plan. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not in this level, then there will be another lower level of more detailed plan. Because obviously the, the lower your level goes, the more detailed the plan becomes. And then right on to you get to like a site or a building plan level. So um, the Metropolitan framework wasn't meant to be, I think, as, as cadastrally detailed for you to because the lines are very notionally drawn and the principles needs to be applied. So your district level takes it a bit more detail and then your local level plan takes it even more detailed. 
So we're hoping to set the broad, the broad principles in this plan. Um, there's still a bit of an argument about how detailed do you go, how rigid do you go, and how flexible do you go. So there's, there's going to be that play between it. But for instance, if we were to take another urban edge as an example forward, then that would be cadastrally defined. Yeah. You, you should know whether you're in or whether you're out because the plan is meant to give that level of clarity and clear direction so you don't have to waste your time or, or be um, running around on things. So, yeah, so we would be looking at giving it the amount of as much clarity and detail that we can. So there's no confusion between it. Okay. Uh, thanks, Nigel. And, and um, I just wanted to know, so, so we were talking, uh, speaking earlier about the, the 2012 plans, um, how that at that point in time would have been the vision for the next sort of uh, five, ten year, years or so. Um, you know, have you guys done an analysis on how, the, how much of the, the, the vision set out in the 2012 plan has been achieved or, um, you know, uh, are there... Um, are there lessons learned from that? Are there, you know, potentially what was needed was more of a, of a, of a strategy at how to, how to work towards that vision? Um, what, in sitting now in 2020, um, how much do you, do you see of, uh, of what was contained in that 2012 plan? Yes, sure, it varies. It varies between the districts um, and also in the districts itself. So, like I said, sometimes you get uh, the proposals to be aligned and they get approved aligned and they implement it like that. In other places, they're not. So in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the products that will come into the public domain within the next couple of months, you will see a bit of outtake on whether we think um, there's been com compliance with or there's been development in line with the plan. Um, we, we, as, as part of the review, we have to bring in uh, a, a look at what happened in the 2012 plan and is it appropriate. I, I, my, I showed my wife the other day all the forward planning documents since 1996 when we started doing a spatial development framework, not we, the city started doing a spatial development framework. There's about five, six of those. Yep. And part of my critique was a lot of the policy is still the same. Yep, but what exactly. happens on the ground is not necessarily the same. So there's, so we try to ask those tough questions. Um, so we at least engage with those, and and I and I encourage people to ask the questions themselves and give us the inputs as well. And Correct. but but the I think my general take has been I think the policy has been in the right direction. Um, but I think it's it's where we've got challenges is the implementation of the policy yeah. or further guidance to help the implementation or to be sure that we're heading in the right direction. So so there, that's where I would like to move more into the sort of facilitation, uh, incentivizing and helping things along with this round of the of the plan. Yeah. Um, because I think it's saying the right kind of things. Um, uh, it, it, it actually reminds me, it reminds me of the, of the, the, the city's TOD uh, f framework and and um, you know how that there was there was the um, it, it it was sort of drafted in a way that that was quite practical I suppose almost like a strategy yes. document not just a policy because when you think of a policy sometimes you just think of a passive document and then yeah. you know you, you've complied you've ticked your box you've complied with legislation you've got the policy in place but then there's no idea of how to realize it um, so yeah I, I hope that um, that all the role players together can figure out a, a, a nice, you know, as as easy as possible, a, a, a method or, or some kind of a, um, a, yeah, a strategy document for how to actually implement, you know, the the vision and how to actually achieve it. So it's not just this passive document. Yes. Um, last question, Nigel. Do you, how are you? Um, how are you currently spending your lockdown? Um, you know, how has work been? Um, how are you managing? And how are you? Uh, how the how, how's the the teamwork been uh, with with people that are that are you know you're no longer sitting in the same office anymore? We've we've had um, because our our branch has had people in uh, district offices, so we've always operated sort of remotely, as it were. So in some way it feels the same, but in another way it's quite quite lonely <laughs> sitting all alone in my office uh, and not having my colleagues around and all of those kind of things. 
that's been i must say i think we, our, our unit is fortunate we've been able to just completely work at home uh all of our colleagues i've just spoken to the last colleague this often to find out he's 3g card working he's got data and all of those so with the exception of one person everybody's got data the person doesn't have it he's a secretary so he doesn't have internet access working well at the moment so we've all been working well the, the, the sort of challenge is just where you need to share your ideas um we've got to present something and then we're not quite we've got to explain it over and over for people to understand it where we could have just thrown it by hand or showed it on the plan right in front of each other so it's a bit challenging from that regard but but we've been working okay i've been enjoying it um i've thoroughly enjoyed not having to spend two hours two to three hours on the road so i get much more quality of my day um and then sort of my internet is i've, I've got good internet access so i don't have a problem in that regard in fact just ironically i was at the office today and i had to do some of these kind of uh, zoom calls at the office and i was really frustrated because it's better at home than at the office <laughs> so i told my director i'm probably gonna stay at home more than come back yes um, yeah I, I, yeah, I hope that I hope that um, that this sort of forced change of habits, um, you know, can can be a, a lesson to everyone, and and hopefully um, can allow people more flexibility in their in their work lives. That would be really useful. I think it will be. It's it's very it's very sensitive like that. Um, yeah, Nigel, uh, that's that's it from my side. Um, I don't know if you have any questions from your side. I just wanted to thank you and, and, and yeah, really say, you know, um, the city is always very helpful and, and open to assist when, when, we've, uh, when we've asked uh, various officials and various people from the city to, to, um, to explain certain complicated ideas. You know, we're, we're a multi, multidisciplinary organize, organization, community. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not a planner. I, 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 a lot of the stuff goes right over my head. So um, yeah, it really, it really helps when, when, um, when the city is, um, makes itself uh, available. Uh, and uh, yeah, I really want to thank you for that. Sean, thank you as well for the opportunity. It's been a great pleasure um, and I've enjoyed it. Um, and I think we would like to engage a bit more in the future. We obviously, as I said, I'm, my intention and our intention is to have quite an interactive approach with the development of the plan as much as we can, time permitting and obviously deadlines permitting. Um, one exciting thing that I wanted to do with the plan, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking to you guys, your colleagues, to maybe assist if we do call, is I wanted to do a training course for community leaders to understand planning and how it works and be involved and to understand it so that when we do engage with the proposals there's a level of understanding um, and then hopefully the engagement is in a much better engagement levels and we can actually have a bit better product out now with obviously with COVID, my my ideas is a bit shipwrecked and but i may still get it done but so we, we, we may want to ask if you guys would be interested if we do send out a call like that to say if there, if there are people that are willing to come help us at a couple of workshops or so just to help communities understand the concepts that we're dealing with, understand what is planning, how it works. Uh, we would really appreciate that kind of support um, for that because I think that, that makes the plan go beyond just a document that gets prepared. It, it becomes an actual participation throughout the process. And then obviously when we do sip it out the document for comments, we'd love your engagements again um, so that we can uh, get diversity of inputs and hopefully get a, a much better product out at the end of it. So thank you for this. I really appreciate it. And I'll we do more on it. We would definitely be, um, be more than keen to, to get involved with that. Thank you so much. Um, let me just check the... Yeah, uh, someone just said awesome. Um, so yes, 100%, we will definitely uh, definitely be keen to, to help out where we can. Brilliant, thanks man. Um, Nigel, have a, have a lovely evening and um, I hope too that we can chat to you again very, very soon, as soon as lockdown's over um, and uh, you know, when, we, when you get, uh, get your public participation back on track, um, you know, all the best. And this, I know this must be the most confusing and difficult process because there's so many layers uh, of complexity. You know, you've got everything from environmental to population density, um, you know, to, to movements uh, in and amongst the, the district itself, but also uh, around the city to, to, to consider 
so much to consider. It must be uh, giving you gray hairs. Um, so good luck uh, and um, hope to chat again soon. Thanks. Thank you very much and thanks for your colleagues. I see you've got Ludolf Lowe as part of the list, so nice to hear from you guys. And thanks for calling on us. Awesome. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers, Nigel. Bye. Bye, Inga. Bye, Rebecca. Bye, Nigel. <laughs>